we are using the St Gabriel's Morning Worship Booklet for all services until further notice. If you don't have it, download it from bit.ly forward slash saint-g-morning-worship or contact Matt Routh. Thank you. Good morning St Gabriel's and welcome to our morning worship for the 12th of July. As we continue our theme looking at the Apostles' Creed, our title for today is The Forgiveness of Sins. Now, we've been in lockdown or in a semi-lockdown state for quite a long time, and you might be finding that um, whether you live with a spouse or um, with friends or whether you live on your own but you just have, um, you know, daily dealings with people that um, you've had to do quite a lot of forgiveness and um, managing um, conflict and trying to communicate really well during this time. It's been a time of heightened anxiety, for sure. Um, And so we're exploring the question, what does it mean to say that we believe in the forgiveness of sins? What does it mean for us that Christ forgave our sins? And what consequences does that have for our day-to-day lives? That's our theme for today. And um, Jill will be um, preaching to us from passages on that theme. And just to let you know that once we reach the end of this series, we're going to have a new series which is based on Bishop Michael Curry's course from the Episcopalian Church in the United States. Um, And we're looking forward to um, exploring his course on the way of Christian life um, after this. Thank you. As usual, our opening words from the St Gabriel's Morning Worship booklet. And if these words are feeling quite overly familiar to you by now, then um, please know that firstly we're looking at doing a new worship booklet with some more options as we continue to offer video services. Um, But secondly, that if you're able to internalise these words, maybe that's a good thing. And maybe you'll be able to pray them uh, with your eyes shut and without needing to use a booklet, um, written on your hearts, as it were, as Jeremiah says in chapter 31. So we have our familiar opening words. Be with us, Spirit of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with your saving power. Speak in us wisdom of God. Bring strength, healing and peace. And as our theme for today is the forgiveness of sins, and as we ask for God's strength, healing and peace, let's bear in mind in silence now, people who we struggle to forgive or the things for which we need forgiveness. And so we say, the Lord is here, his spirit is with us. And we'll now have our first song. As we prepare to confess our sins before God, let's sing Purify My Heart, as we pray that God would again purify Cleanse and renew us. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as Want 
We now come again to confess our sins, separately on our homes perhaps, but joined together as the church. We confess them corporately before God, knowing that through faith in Jesus Christ, he will forgive and he will heal. In the presence of our holy and merciful Lord, we measure our Christian lives against the nine fruits listed by St. Paul. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy and peace. Forgive us, Lord when we have pursued our own interests rather than the things that make for peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The fruit of the Spirit is patience, kindness and generosity. Forgive us, Lord, when we have been intolerant of other people's failings or uncaring about their needs. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Forgive us, Lord, when we have let people down or failed to place our trust in you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace now and forever. Amen. We now have the Collect for the fifth week after Trinity. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth to the glory of your name. Through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we learn this morning about the forgiveness of sins in Christ, let us remember that for us personally, whoever we are, whatever we've done, through belief in Jesus Christ, God forgave my sin freely, freely. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you To share his love as he told me to He said, freely, freely you have received Freely, freely give Go in my name and because you believe Others will know that I live. All power is given in Jesus' name, in earth and heaven, in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his power as he told me to. He said, Freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. Go in my name and because you believe, others will know that I live. He said, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely. And because you believe, others will know that I live. The reading is taken from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. Light and darkness, sin and forgiveness. This is a message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. 
in whom there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, St. Gabriel's. Our reading today is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, St. Gabriel's. We're thinking this morning in our theme of following the phrases we say in the Apostles' Creed, we're thinking about forgiveness, giving and receiving forgiveness. And I want to begin by telling you a story about forgiveness. One Saturday, when I was a very little girl, I was very fascinated by fire. And that Saturday, for some reason, my parents had left me alone with my small sister. And I put some twigs in my sister's toy wheelbarrow. And then I got some matches and set light to the twigs. They were very, very dry and so they flared up instantly. The flames scared me and I knew what I'd done was wrong and I rushed to find something to put them out with. The only thing to hand was a squeezy bottle full of washing up liquid. It did the trick, but left a charred mess of washing up liquid and burnt sticks 
in my sister's nice new red metal wheelbarrow. Well, I then found a cloth and I tried to wipe it out. I was semi-successful, but my parents came back quite quickly and the job was only half done. Later on, my mum saw the wheelbarrow and said, what a mess. How did that get like that? I kept quiet, but I felt guilty. Guilt for doing wrong is part of the human condition. It's part of being human, I believe. All of us do wrong things, sometimes deliberately and sometimes without thinking. We mess up and things need to be put right. And that, in the simplest terms, is why Jesus needed to die on the cross for that. I think there's an example of that very early on in the Bible in Genesis when Adam and Eve are told not to eat of the fruit of a certain tree. They do so and then they feel guilty and God calls to them in the garden and they see their nakedness and are ashamed and they hide from God. So hiding from God and sometimes hiding, trying to hide our guilt from ourselves, I think are also part of being human. But when we try to hide, then there's a deep down lurking awareness of sin and guilt and shame, which is still there. In the Good Friday hymn, there is a green hill far away, we sing, we, we believe it was for us that he, Jesus, hung and suffered there. The hymn goes on, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. The sense of our own sinfulness and failure is usually fairly strong in most of us and we call it conscience. It's being aware of those places where we've messed up, where we've hurt others and sometimes hurt ourselves and offended God. We're often aware inside ourselves but not always so ready to ask for God's forgiveness or perhaps to ask for other people's forgiveness. But we're reminded of this as the Christian community each time we gather together, when we say the Creed and when we say the Lord's Prayer. In the Apostles' Creed, that early statement of Christian belief, we say Sunday by Sunday, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints and the forgiveness of sins. And in the Lord's Prayer we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So there's two parts of forgiveness, receiving forgiveness from God and from others and giving forgiveness to others. And you could say that both parts of forgiveness are part of the essentials of a Christian life. They are essentials of discipleship. But although we say the words each Sunday, and I'm sure we mean them, I would say that both these things are quite hard for us to do. I think we can tell this partly because in the Gospels Jesus told quite a few stories and parables about forgiveness and it's one of these that we heard read to us this morning. In the one we heard read to us just now, Jesus answers a question put to him by Simon Peter. 
And Peter's question doesn't just come out of the blue, because Jesus has already been teaching all about sin and forgiveness in the Christian community. Jesus has, in the few verses previous to what we read, used a very strong image. He has said to the disciples, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The disciples, Jesus' friends then, and us now, his followers, the beloved community, we are given the authority of Jesus to bind or release others from sin and from guilt. So coming to Jesus in repentance for the wrong we do is really important. But forgiving hearts that go out to others to forgive and release them is just as important. Some of us find it hard to come to Jesus, to confess, to acknowledge our habitual failings and to receive this forgiveness. Sometimes that reluctance to come can go back to events a long time in our past. We may be able to come to Jesus for the day-to-day -day events, the things that are happening to us now, but sometimes there are things a long way back that it's hard to bring. And sometimes that's almost a stronghold of the enemy that binds us and perhaps needs to be broken by the power of God. And some of us find it hard to turn a generous heart to others, to offer grace, to wipe the slate clean, to give to others the chance of a fresh start. And in withholding that gift of forgiveness, we bind others. And some of us find it hard to do both, hard to receive God's forgiveness and hard to forgive and release other people who've injured or hurt us. Peter, it seems, was someone who really took time for the penny to drop about what Jesus was saying. So in this story we've read, he comes to Jesus saying, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And it's almost like he's kind of thinking there's some kind of limit. If I've done that, I've satisfied the commands of God. But Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times. But 77 times, meaning of course that we need to be asked to forgive unendingly. There's no magic number where our forgiveness ought to be exhausted because God's forgiveness, God's generosity, God's abounding love is never ending. But then in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus then goes on to tell the parable about the unforgiving servant. And some people think that this parable may have been added a little later. And maybe simply adding it suggests that perhaps forgiveness and receiving forgiveness may have been a problem in the community that Matthew was writing to. Anyway. Jesus tells the parable about the servant. And in this parable, the first servant who owes an absolutely colossal debt to his king, and in the parable, the king is likely to represent God. This servant is forgiven. He is released from his debt altogether with his wife and children and all his possessions. And he could have been expected to have lost them all because the gift is so enormous, he hadn't got any possibility of paying, but the king releases him and he is set free from that debt and that freedom extends to his whole household. 
And you might say he could have been expected after this to have had a sense of the abundant, overflowing, excessive love of God. This is the amazing grace which the former slaveholder John Newton writes about in the famous and much loved hymn, I once was lost, but now am found. It's the grace extended to the prodigal son who returns to the forgiving father. It's the grace that we receive when we come to Jesus humbly and in sorrow and we ask for forgiveness, we ask for release. But in this story, instead of appreciating the grace abounding of the king that has released him from his debt, this first servant goes out and threatens violently one of his fellow servants who owes him a hundred pence. He seizes this poor servant by the throat and despite his fellow servants pleading for this man's life, he will not let him off and throws him into prison. And the fellow servants watching are so distressed by this lack of equality and justice that they go into the king, in allegorical terms remember, the king is God, and they report all that has happened. And then the punchline of the story is that the king this time orders the first servant's torture until he should pay his entire debt. The parable is so extreme. What are we to make of it in terms of how we live our Christian lives? Tom Wright says something like this. Forgiveness isn't like the meal waiting for you back home if you fail to buy a sandwich for the homeless man on the street. Forgiveness isn't like the Christmas present for a sulky child from a kindly grandfather. No, forgiveness is more like the air in your lungs. There's only room for you to inhale the next lungful when you've just breathed out the previous one. If you insist on withholding forgiveness to others, you will also be locked up in receiving. There's something about openness here, something about a simplicity and childlikeness, that being great in the kingdom of heaven is a bit like being turned inside out and becoming like a little child. We, each of us, are likely to have historic patterns of resentment. We acquire these patterns through life towards people who have injured us along the way. Maybe, maybe not all of us. Maybe some people are so full of the grace of God that they're just able to let go of these things. But many of us carry these small hurts along the way. And they may even be woven so deeply into our lives as historic resentments that we hold on to them, even if just unconsciously. But sometimes holding on to past hurts means that we're very likely to spill over frustrations into our present lives. And sometimes those frustrations spill out towards others who may remind us of those who did us the injury. So I think there's both a current and a historic meaning to coming to Jesus day by day, Sunday by Sunday, and asking to give and receive forgiveness. Of course we want to be aware of those small things that have happened in the course of each 24 hours that we need to let go of, that we need to confess, that we need to acknowledge and we need God's grace and help to help us change and be different. But sometimes there is perhaps a challenge to 
search deeper down and to allow God to gently, lovingly um, help us to become aware of those things which are more deeply rooted in our lives, where we hold patterns of anger and frustration towards individuals, maybe towards whole scenarios that have harmed and hurt us along the way. These things are not easily released and I don't want to speak too lightly of them, particularly those things where very, very deep injury has indeed been done. But ultimately, the kingdom way, Jesus' way, is to show us something different. He says, freely, freely you've received, freely, freely give. Go in my name and because you believe, others will know that I live. That's the challenge this morning. Releasing others, forgiving others, is a day in, day out task. And it's part of the challenge of discipleship. Following Jesus, releasing others, forgiving others, is a way of truly releasing ourselves from old patterns. And in the end, there is simply no other way to be in Jesus' kingdom. And so it is a lifelong challenge. Worship, though, can draw us close into the heart of God. When our hearts are full to overflowing with all that our generous Lord has done for us, it should be easier to extend gracious and generous hearts to others. And of course, the gift of music, which many of us are missing so much, the gift of being together, to sing together, is part of the way that God, through his spirit, works in our hearts. But in the privacy of our homes, we can draw close to God in other ways. And one of the ways we can do this is by reading, and perhaps even reading aloud, the words of the Psalms. And maybe there's a challenge this week that we might read a psalm each day and ask God to help us join in the words of the psalm, both the words of anger and frustration because there's a great deal of anger and frustration in the psalms. But also often there is a movement in many psalms of reminder of recollecting God's goodness, God's generosity, God's saving help, and in reminding ourselves of those things, in recollecting those things of God's goodness, we come closer to God to have our own hearts cleansed and made new. And this is what we pray for this morning. And so as we join in the words of the Apostles' Creed, as we join in the words of the Lord's Prayer, we pray that we might not only say with our lips, but believe in our hearts and practice in our lives that giving and receiving in forgiveness that Jesus offers, that Jesus teaches, that Jesus commands us to. So let's pray now. And as we pray, dear Lord, we know that you are not, in fact, a vengeful king. The picture of the servant in this story, although an extreme and exaggerated one, may in fact be a picture of some of our hearts sometimes, where we are so unaware of the immensity of your forgiveness for us. But you are not a vengeful king and you go on pouring out generous love towards us. And so our prayer this morning is that we might receive freely that generous love 
that we might know the cleansing and the renewing of your forgiveness and that out of that cleansing and renewing of our lives that we ourselves might be able to extend the hand of friendship, of generosity, of reconciliation towards any who have injured us, towards any who have harmed us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We now come to affirm our faith, not in the full version of the Apostles' Creed, which we've had preaching on throughout our series, but in the shorter version in the St Gabriel's Morning Worship booklet. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, the source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We come now to a time of prayer. Please, when I say, Lord, in your mercy, respond by saying, hear our prayer. We pray for your church. As your people, may we remember that Christ's blood has washed us clean and we are pure in your eyes. Help us to reflect your love and goodness to those around us, to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the great beauty of your creation, the sun, the rain, the trees and grass. Help us to want to protect your world and act responsibly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for each other and all people made in your image. Help us to live in peace with each other and act with kindness and patience towards each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless Elizabeth, our Queen. Give her wisdom and strength in all her duties and bring her peace. Bless those in authority and give them compassion in their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless our community, especially in this time of uncertainty and need. Bring employment and prosperity to our area for all its residents. Help those struggling with strained relationships in this turbulent time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. May they know your presence and believe in your love for them. Give them patience and trust in your unfailing love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the communion of saints, those who have died and those who mourn for them. Give those who mourn peace and comfort. We bring to you those on our hearts in prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hello again. Um, I just wanted to say in our notices slot a big thanks to Michael um, for putting together the service last week while I was away. And we had a restful time. Thank you for everyone who sent their best wishes. 
I also wanted to let you know as our church, St Gabriel's, that um, we will be moving in late August, um, as, as we announced when we were all together. But yeah, that time has crept up on us due to lockdown. Um, I'm going to keep doing um, the service videos for the rest of July, uh, and then there'll be um, a, a slightly different plan, which um, will probably do something a little bit different, but it will still be um, uh, possible to watch remotely um, from your homes and to join in with worship that way. Um, but there'll be more information about that soon. Um, but as I do my last few services, um, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone for your encouragement, for your participation and for your feedback and ideas. And while it has been um, a busy time, um, it has also been um, a source of joy because of those things. So thank you. Now, I know that one thing we've been sad to miss while we've been in lockdown and not meeting in person has been the opportunity to mark people's birthdays and to sing to them on Sunday. And uh, I'm aware that I've missed lots of birthdays and I'm sorry about that. And we haven't really been doing it. But this week there's been lots of birthdays, so I thought we should. Um, because on um, Friday we had uh, Vanessa's birthday, our rector. And then on Saturday it was both her husband Cameron's birthday and, key for us, it was also Lawrence's birthday on Saturday. So I thought we just couldn't let that pass without singing um, to Lawrence, happy birthday and God bless you from all of us at St Gabriel's and remembering Vanessa and Cameron too. So let's sing. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. And I hope you had a great day on Saturday. Thank you. How deep the Father's love for us. As we sing this now classic song, let us remember, as it says in the third verse, this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. <laughs> Our closing responses. A blessing on you who are poor, 
Yours is the kingdom of God. A blessing on you who mourn, you shall be comforted. A blessing on you who hunger for justice, you shall be satisfied. A blessing on you who make peace, you shall be called children of God. A blessing on you who are persecuted for the cause of the right, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, accompany us in this day's journey, dawn on our darkness. Open our eyes to praise you for your creation and to see the work you set before us today. Take us and use us to bring to others the new life that you give. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.